The Sahara Desert, three and a half million square miles of eerie, beautiful emptiness. And not the first place that springs to mind if you're thinking about cool destinations to bring a new 12 cylinder supercar. The heat, the sand, the rocks, they're all pretty scary in a scarlet Ferrari. But it was that incongruity nearly 30 years ago that made a star of Car Magazine's cover story, Ferrari to the Sahara. And with a brand new 715 horsepower Ferrari to put to the test, it feels like it might be time to come back. Cut to the right here, right now, and the reboot is on. Behind me is Europe. Beneath me is Ferrari's V12 Pura Sangue. And some 600 miles that way is the desert. It's time to take this Ferrari to the Sahara. Crossing from Europe to Africa requires nothing more than a couple of hours on the ferry and an anxious wait to be allowed through Moroccan customs. Back then it was a miracle the original story's author, Richard Bremner, made it that far. But his pitch to Ferrari was perfectly timed. Ferrari had an ex-engineering 512M kicking about and desperately wanted to tackle the idea that its cars were fragile, that they'd break if you did big miles in them. Driving its flagship supercar to the Sahara would prove that Ferraris were as tough as they were fast. So this is it. The road to the Sahara starts here, rolling off the ferry at Tangiers in a 12-cylinder red Ferrari almost 30 years after Carr did it the first time with the 512M. Can't quite believe we're here, but really exciting. That original story took nearly 10 years to put together. They had the idea back in 86, speeding across Morocco in a Peugeot 309 of all things, thinking this would be a cool place to bring a supercar. And then of course finally pulled it together with the 512M. This time around, it's taken us just over a year to put the plan in place. So originally we were gonna come last summer in the V8 hybrid SF90, a supercar and a kind of, I guess, the spiritual successor to the 512M. But when you reread that story, you appreciate how important the sort of majesty of that 12 cylinder engine was. And of course, at September last year, Ferrari pulled the covers off this car, the V12 Pura Sangue. And that kind of felt right, so here we are. And what better a Ferrari for an adventure than the first adventure-ready Ferrari? But there is nothing adventurous about this stretch of motorway, south from Tangier to Marrakesh. This is Morocco at its most developed, nearly 400 miles of immaculate, toll-maintained motorway with Shell, McDonald's and Burger King. You could be in Spain, but for the currency and the signs, many of which show place names in Arabic and Berber, as well as Spanish. The combination of smooth motorway and effortless pura sangue makes driving these miles a breeze, and certainly far easier than covering the same ground 30 years ago would have been in Ferrari's low, hot, noisy, and definitely less comfortable supercar. We should talk a little bit about the 512M, the car they came in back in 1995. It was Ferrari's flagship at the time, but in truth, it was a bit of a glorious relic, essentially a 1980s car dragged kicking and screaming into the mid 1990s. It started life as the Testarossa, that absolute icon of the 1980s. But by the mid 90s, it had a couple of refreshes, first as the 512TR and then the M. But there was a lot going on at Ferrari at the time, including two really important new cars, the 456 GT and the glorious mid-engined F355. And one of the reasons the M looked a little bit awkward is it had the kind of smiley mouth from the 456 GT and the little round backlights from the F355. So yeah, it may have been a bit of an anachronism, but people absolutely adored it, mainly of course for that powertrain, for that flat 12 engine and that glorious manual gearbox. When the 512M arrived in 1995, Ferrari was going through a period of intense transformation. And that was the work of one man, Luca de Montezemolo. He joined Ferrari originally in 73, 
and became Enzo's assistant. Enzo had made him boss of the F1 team and the success came pretty quickly with a couple of F1 titles in the 70s. And then in 1991, Fiat boss Gianni Agnelli made de Montezemolo boss of Ferrari. And we had a couple of really important cars quite quickly, the F355 and the 456 GT. And they really showed the way to the future, transforming the company. It went from a pretty ropey financial situation to huge profit. And he did that by limiting volume, refreshing the lineup and taking Ferrari right back to the sharp end of Formula One. It was on his watch, of course, that we had that period of incredible dominance through the noughties with Ross Braun, Michael Schumacher and Jean Tot when those red cars seem to win every weekend. And right now, in 2023, well, Ferrari is a success story like few others. Some really shrewd commercial moves, plus that uber successful stock market flotation. I've seen it go from strength to strength. Revenue last year was a cool 5 billion euros from something like 13,000 cars sold. And then in September last year, it pulled the covers off its first four-door four-seater, the Pura Sangue, and really the first Ferrari production road car in history not to sit as low to the road as was humanly possible. Just don't call it an SUV. This stretch still feels like a dumb place to hold a Ferrari flat out. It's absolutely crawling with police and speed cameras looking to take a few dirhams out of your wallet. So it's cruise control on, keep going and looking forward to Marrakesh. So let's talk numbers. Back in 1995, the flagship 512M would have cost you 140,000 pounds. Adjust for inflation and that's about 270 grand in today's money. So about the same as the 296 GTB. But the Pura Sangue, that's a different creature. So starting at 310,000 pounds before options and really difficult to keep it under 400,000. This one's worth just under 400K. Certainly anybody who thought it was gonna come along and take Ferrari sales volumes through the roof like the KN or the Bentayga has achieved, got it quite wrong. So the 512M rode on those super cool 18 inch turbine style wheels, which Ferrari claimed at the time pulled cooling air in onto the brakes. Not sure about the science of that, but they look pretty ace. Quite a bit bigger on the Pura Sangue, so 22 inch front, 23 inch rear, and then carbon ceramic brakes. But more importantly on the braking side, it's a brake by wire system, which is quite unusual on a non-hybrid car. The system was actually developed for the 296 GTB, but it's on here because it gives you way more possibilities when it comes to adjusting the brake bias, which is just another tool in the armory, I guess, to help Ferrari make this handle like no SUV before it. The Pura Sangue has got a pretty special suspension system, and we knew that right from 2018 when Ferrari first confirmed the car was on its way. So it takes basically all of the current ideas around how you make your SUV handle with adaptive damping and active anti-roll bars and kind of throws it in the bin. And instead we've got four really clever Multimatic units, one at each corner. And the way to think about these is instead of a smooth damping rod, it's like a screw thread. And then you've got a really powerful electric motor geared to that thread. And what it does is give the car complete control over everything it's doing, how much it rolls, how much it pitches, not to mention the sort of spring rates and damping rates. So the advantages are absolutely massive. There are normal springs on this car as well, but they're here literally just to hold it up when you turn it off so it doesn't sink to the ground like an old Citroen. In terms of the body, we've got an aluminium intensive construction with that carbon fiber roof just to bring the center of gravity down a bit. And then in the back, a 450 litre boot. So pretty big for a Ferrari, but still smaller than rivals like the Urus and the DBX. And then of course, suicide rear doors. Because if you're gonna have four doors for the first time ever on a Ferrari, you're not gonna make them normal, are you? And so to the main event, the 12 cylinder engine. Back in the 512M, that was the flat 12. And when you read the contemporary road test, there's definitely a theme that emerges. People moan about the slightly cramped cabin and the slightly ropey ergonomics. And then they get to talking about the engine and just absolutely lose their minds. There was nothing like it and there really was nothing like it. It was the only flat 12 on sale at the time. Unfortunately, in Ferraris, we've still got 12 cylinder engines. So in the Pura Sangue, it's the six and a half litre V12 putting out 715 horsepower. Some have questioned the wisdom of an SUV without the torque of a turbocharged engine, but 715 horsepower doesn't feel like roughing it to me. That's driving through a twin clutch gearbox and four wheel drive. The 512M had that exquisite open gate manual, but I guess you can't have everything.
transition from cruise-controlled, cool-as-a-cucumber motorway to frenzied Marrakesh is abrupt and it is violent. Morocco's fourth largest city and one of Africa's very busiest, it is not a place to drive windows up, stereo on. You really want to take it all in. The chatter of conversation, the cries of market traders, parping horns, squealing brakes. Driving here is, according to the internet at least, the stuff of nightmares. But in truth, it's pretty special, as memorable as the Stelvio Pass or California's Pacific Coast Highway, just in a very different way. It's about driving like you mean it, going with the flow and, in this car at least, not thinking about the potential repair bills. In truth, the Ferrari helps and hinders in equal measure. Visibility is a mixed bag. Yes, the driving position is higher than every other Ferrari in the company's 75-year history, but you can't see much out of the back and that endless bonnet creates a terrifying blind spot on the other side of the nose. At least the steering and the brakes are on your side, as are the blind spot monitors and the parking sensors, all of which work overtime as you try to thread what isn't a small car through ancient labyrinthine streets. This is a city in which cars really don't belong. But maybe roads on which a pure sangue does belong aren't too far away. to the really good stuff, the first proper driving roads of the trip. So we're on the mountain pass high up in the high atlas between Marrakesh and Ouazazate, which is kind of the gateway to the desert and to the Sahara. And in the original story, you get the sense that this is the first time they can really drive the car properly and that everything starts to spread its wings. And almost 30 years on, we're in exactly the same boat, getting to really extend the pure sangue. Now Richard talks about battering the silver balled gear lever, dancing on the pedals and twirling the unassisted wheel this way and that. He even drops the windows to better hear the flat 12 engine and I can totally sympathise. I mean out here with these rock faces because that's all there is really. The engine just completely fills your world. It's magical. But fortunately, every bit as magical is the body control, the steering, and the brakes. I mean, given the comfort we drove down in yesterday on the motorway with the dampers round white off, it was so compliant. And yet here we've got a spooky amount of body control. I mean, the setup engineers could have done literally anything. They could have held the body completely flat in corners if they'd wanted to, but they knew that would feel weird. So you get a little bit of roll just to help your brain understand what's going on. And then just this incredible sense of being able to lean on the car. And likewise, the steering, it was a bit too direct for brain off motorway cruising. If you go for a water bottle in the door bin or check the nav or something, you can quite easily change a couple of lanes, but get up here and the steering just feels absolutely perfect. There's no dead zone really around the dead ahead. Just this easy turn in with a couple of degrees of lock and then a really nice sense of connection to the front axle. You get a bit of understeer on the way in if you overdo things, but that just helps you find the limit and then lean on the traction on the way out. And then the brakes, like we said, brake by wire, so no real physical connection between the pedal, the calipers and the discs, but an incredible sense of feel. It's really short travel, just a couple of degrees, do all the work you need, and the sensitivity of it is just, well, thank God they've got them because it lets you do more of this.
journey east towards the desert is a bewildering display of Morocco's raw beauty. Huge views and no traffic to distract you from them, just the birds overhead and goats surviving somehow in this hot and harsh emptiness. Rounding one corner, I even discover a stretch of road familiar from the original story. Only progress means that where then it zigzagged around the mountains, it now runs smooth as glass right through an 80-foot wall of rock. Increasingly, fuel becomes a worry. Petrol stations are strung further and further apart. And as the Sahara gets closer, they're nothing like the squeaky clean places I've been to so far. These are little more than one-room buildings with a couple of pumps in the yard, together with the scorched crankcases of long dead engines. Purisangue settles back into a fast, low-effort cruise. Gnarled milestones flash past. This is a long way, some 900 miles from Tangier to the Sahara, none of them easy. Unless, it seems, you're in this Ferrari. Really then, it's just a question of stamina, of being able to put in the hours behind the wheel of what is, thankfully, the most comfortable car Marinello has ever made. This, ultimately, is where your money goes. Making land travel this fast and this easy is expensive, and the Pure Sangue is not cheap. 312 grand before options, and likely north of 400,000 if you spec it like a typical buyer. All that money and you don't even get inbuilt sat-nav. It's a familiar stick with which to beat the Pure Sangue, but honestly, to me it feels like a smart choice. When Waze and Google Maps are so good and so familiar, why offer an in-house option that nobody will use? A bigger annoyance are the swipe controls on the steering wheel, which, even after a week on the road, remain frustratingly hit and miss. But whatever, I've got more important things on my mind. Finally, after long days of flat-out driving, there are sand dunes on the horizon. I can't quite believe it, but we're finally here in the Sahara. So it's taken almost a week's worth of driving. It's that ferry over to Tangier, the motorway to Marrakesh, the absolute madness of that city, the gorgeous madness of that city. Then the epic mountain pass, and then in southern Morocco, just these arrow straight roads across the plains. The kind of stuff that you get in America and Australia that you just can't get your head around if you live in built up Europe. And now we're here, with the wind and the sand and the sun of the Sahara in a bright red V12 Ferrari. And it'd be a bit of a shame, wouldn't it, to go home without driving off-road? After all, they couldn't do that in a 512M. Right then, let's do it. Let's drive a Ferrari in the Sahara. <laughs> Feels a bit weird to say that. So while driving a Ferrari in the Sahara sounds weird, really weird, in reality, it just feels easy. Because I mean, the car's got it all, hasn't it? It's got the ground clearance, it's got the four wheel drive system, and it's got all that power. So, you know, the likelihood of getting stuck feels pretty unlikely with that V12 on tap. And I think the way to think about this car is not so much you know, throwing your hands in the air at the idea of a V12 Ferrari that's an SUV, or kind of an SUV, is to think about it as an enabler of enjoying this engine. And it is such an incredible engine. But you think about the cars that have used it previously, so LaFerrari or the 812 Competition. I mean, really focused machines, performance machines for the road and the track. And you're not going to take those in here. But the Pura Sangue's got it all. It can do the touring, and then it can come to places like this. And you can enjoy yourself. It's just, well, it's surreal, but it's pretty magical. Magical really is the word. This has been one hell of a drive. Biting cold, ferocious heat, fast motorway days, 
mountain passes, raging sandstorms, the madness of Marrakesh, 8,000 RPM gear changes, and the Pura Sangue has monstered them all. Awesomely quick, totally reliable, and super talented. This trip was easier than the original in so many ways. Google, email, WhatsApp. We didn't need to worry about getting lost or running out of ground clearance or getting stuck. Unknowable places are increasingly hard to find, but that's not the Pura Sangue's fault. And while a 512M was undoubtedly more alien here in 1995 than this car was now, the reception has been every bit as crazy. The excitement this thing causes everywhere it goes is still clear to see. And while it's obvious perhaps that the Pura Sangue is the more comfortable car, it's worth remembering that despite the elevated four-door silhouette, it's also the faster car. The M may look every inch a true supercar, but with just 440 horsepower to the Pura Sangue is 715, the Pura Sangue is faster to 60 miles an hour, faster over the quarter of a mile, and so much faster on real roads in all weathers that you really wouldn't see which way it went. Nearly 30 years have passed since the 512's Sahara adventure and mine. Yet somehow in this ancient and incredible landscape, that time feels arbitrary and somehow meaningless, like the two cars might be echoes of each other. Was this journey tougher and more dramatic in 1995 in the mid-engined 512M? Of course it was. But does that in any way diminish the emotional heft of this drive in this car? I don't think so.